since the roll has closed, since the enrollment has closed and the roll has been set for the most part, I'm going to start uh, creating a roll sheet that's got your name on it, just initial by your name, and I'll start it at the back so that it gets to the front by the end of the class. Make sure that she's signed it. Credit for being here. So we talked last time we were finishing up the definitions and we talked about what the current uh, definition is, that marketing is the activity for creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that benefit customers, the organization, stakeholders, and society at large. I think this is a pretty good definition, but as I told you, I add to it in that I think that there should be a recognition that this is something that is done by everybody and we do it constantly even when we're not thinking about it. It is a pervasive social activity. We market ourselves all the time. We want people to like us. We want people to hire us. So we sell. A resume is fundamentally a marketing document for you. It's about you marketing to a prospective employer the value of the skills that you can bring to them. So one of the things that I try to do in this class, and we're going to start talking about strategies, and I want you to think about this from a personal perspective. The text is largely written from the perspective of a large corporation. Why do we have texts that are written from the perspective of large corporations? Well, because they're easy to study. Why are they easy for marketers to study? Well, publicly traded corporations particularly are a plethora of data for marketers because they have to file these things in the United States with the Securities and Exchange Commission called 10 Qs and 10 Ks. Who are my accountants? What's a 10 Q or a 10 K? What? Yeah, the, the Q is the quarterly reports that publicly traded companies are expected. Like expected, and the K is the what? Yeah, the K is the annual report that they're expected. So they're this large, a uh, voluminous amount of data. They're easy to follow because what? They produce a lot of advertisements usually for, for big corporations. Think about Ford. How many you know, advertisements do you see for Ford in a week? What do we know? What should come tripping off your tongue about Ford? Bill Ford Tuffin is the number one selling truck in America for something like 20 years running. Ford is the number one selling, the F-150 is the number one selling truck. So we study these, but I really think that because it is this pervasive social activity, you should think about how you can apply these things to your own needs, which are ultimately, when you graduate from here, getting a job and being successful in life. And so what should you think about? Well, it's a pervasive social activity. How do you do that? You want people to, to like you. You market yourself to your friends, and you market yourself to your prospective employers. And this thing called a resume is an important part of that. So what should you do in thinking about your resume? You should always have your resume. You should keep it up to date. But you should tailor it specifically for the job that you are applying for. Now, I do not suggest in this day and age in which we can find out so much information about you that you lie or you fudge or you tag your resume because people will find out. And unless you're the president of the United States, you can't get away with lying in this day and age. Because people will find out and they will, they will call you on it. But that doesn't mean that you can't emphasize what's most important. So for example, my resume as an academic when I applied for jobs, I wanted to come to you, I wanted to come back to UCO. So I started out at UCO as an academic years and years and years ago, and I was not a marketer. I was a political scientist. I have a bachelor's and master's degree in political science, and I have the Juris Doctor's degree. So I was the university's attorney. What makes UCO different, for example, from OU? Diversity. Diversity? Do you think we're more or less diverse? Size and funding. Okay, size and funding, that makes UCO different. What else makes UCO different from OU or OSU? So we're slightly smaller. We're not all that much smaller, though, by the way. What is OU? We're about 18,000. What's OU's student population? I think, I don't know, I haven't looked. I think it's about 25,000. So it's not much bigger than UCF. We're a commuter college. We're a commuter college. Yeah. 
That's a big difference. The vast majority of students that go to OU live what? On or near campus. The vast majority of students who go to UCO live where? You live all over the place. How many of you live close to campus? Okay, a few. A lot of you in this class. But we have a lot of students that come from Guthrie. They come from Midwest City. They come from, you know, Mustang, Yukon, all over the metro and all across the state. The other thing that makes UCO different than OU or OSU is that historically, what was UCO's first mission? Well, we started out long before Oklahoma was a state as the territorial normal school. That's a, as opposed to the territorial abnormal school, which would be OU, I guess. What's a normal school? Anybody know what that meant? It's a teaching school. That's exactly right. We're a teacher's college. And so our focus has always been on teaching. So when I wanted to come back to UCO, I left, and I went to New Mexico State and taught New Mexico State, which is a research one institution. And what they focus on at New Mexico State is research. What we focus on at UCO is what? Teaching. So when I came back and I applied again to come back to UCO, my resume, rather than focusing to show you how this works, Rather than focusing on the academic publications I had, I focused on what? Teaching. Teaching. The biggest section of my resume, or my curriculum vita, which is what we call it in academics, focused on teaching. And my connection and my student evaluations. If I had applied for a job at OU, I would not have focused on that. I would have focused on what? My research. Why? When I went to talk to OU, the dean or the, the department chair of marketing down there said, well, you know, teaching is something that one must endure in order to do research. That gives you an idea of the importance of students at OU. Right? Teaching is something that one must, as if it's a dreaded disease that you had to overcome. But if I was going to apply for a job at OU, I'd focus on all my publications rather than focus on teaching. So you highlight the positive. Look at, get the job description for the job that you want to apply for, and then tailor your resume to that. If what they want is they want someone who is, for example, you know, good with communication and sales, you want to put all of your what? If you had a paper route in high school, you don't necessarily want to highlight that as the number one thing. But if you worked in the mall and retail and in customer service, you would want to move that up. So highlight the things that are important. So it's this pervasive social activity. Well, what do we have to have for marketing to occur? Well, we have to have more than one party. You can't market to yourself. That's called motivation, not marketing. You have to have a desire and an ability on the part of both parties to be satisfied. If I'm marketing myself, I wanted a job, which by the way, if you want a really good job, marketing professor is the best job on the planet. This last year at AMA, there were about 10 jobs for every candidate. Not 10 candidates for every job, there were 10 jobs for every candidate. The average starting salary for a marketing professor is $160,000 a year. Not bad. You have to get a PhD, but it's worth it. I work two days a week, Tuesday and Thursday, and I'm only here until 12.15. Think about it, folks. It's a good job. I highly encourage you. If you want to do this, I can help you do this. So you have to have an ability and a desire. So I wanted a job. UCL wanted a marketing faculty member. So we met that requirement. Communication. We had to have a way of communicating. How am I going to tell them that I want the job, and how are they going to tell me that there's a job open? Well, they're going to post the job on their job board. They're going to print it in the Chronicle of Higher Education. They're going to put it on 
various job sites like marketing, jo marketingphdjobs.com, which is the aggregator for marketing faculty members who want jobs. And then you have to have something to exchange. Exchange is critical to marketing. Now, the exchange doesn't have to be tangential, a tangible, tangible product. It can be an idea. What is it that I give to UCF? What am I exchanging? I'm exchanging my knowledge and my service as an educator in exchange for what? A paycheck. And a happy place to come two days a week. Right? We fun. So there's this exchange. So marketing relies on something to exchange. Now that exchange can be feelings. When you market yourself to your friends, what is it that you want? Well, you want companionship, you want camaraderie, you want good times. But there's something there to exchange. So that's what's needed for marketing to occur. Now, it's more than that, right? So let's talk about strategy. How are you going to go about doing this? Well, you have to develop goals. What are goals? What are your goals? Graduate. Okay, what's a good goal? Let's talk about what is a good goal. Is to graduate a good goal? Who says yes? How many of you say yes? You're tentative. <laughs> Why are you so pensive about this goal? It's not high enough. What? If it's not high enough, like just graduating, it's not necessarily good enough. Oh, yeah, I think that's right. You're, you're actually, why is that not just good enough? Why is that not good enough? Because if you can't get a job, it doesn't matter. If you can't get a job, it doesn't matter. You don't learn what you're studying, what's the point? If you what? If you don't learn what you're studying, what's the point? Okay, so you want to learn something along the way to this goal, just graduating? So is graduating a good goal? I don't know. Is it a bad goal? It's not a bad goal, but it's not necessarily a good goal. So there's a continuum. Terrible goal. What's a terrible goal? What's an example of a terrible goal? Getting arrested. Getting arrested. <laughs> I don't know. That might be a good goal. <laughs> you make it better. What would be a totally terrible goal? I mean, if you want, I mean, getting arrested may not be a bad goal. Let's think about this. You're a homeless person on the streets of Oklahoma City today. What's the temperature out there? Six degrees or something like that. I mean, it's some ungodly, you know, low figure. In fact, I traded cars with my mother this morning because I drive a Dodge Ram 3500, it's a diesel. It takes forever for diesels to warm up. So it's like, I, I'm to campus before my heater really kicks in. My mother has a Honda Element, and like it's, it's like on fire the minute you turn it on. <laughs> you know, you don't have to go out. First of all, with the diesel, what do you have to do? You have to go out, and you, can you just turn the diesel on? No, you can't do that, right? In the olden days, you had to, in weather like this, they had a plug on them, and you had to plug them in, because they had these heaters. But they now have internal heaters, so you have to go out, you have to turn the, the ignition on, and you have to sit there and wait while the blow plugs heat up before you can start the diesel. And then it takes forever for it to get warm. So I borrowed my mother's car today, which is why I have the frog. I usually have the frog hanging when I borrow the car out of my, out of my pocket. Um, so I have the frog like this. And hers, Honda Element, it's a, it's a great car. So you're in Oklahoma City today, it's six degrees or 16 degrees. Is there a big difference between six and 16? Not really. Your flesh is freezing out there. You're a homeless person. Getting arrested might be a really good goal. It might be the difference between survival and death. Sweet, sweet death on the streets of Oklahoma City, right? You get arrested, you're going to go to what? To jail, they're going to do what? They're going to feed you. They're going to give you a fashionable wardrobe that consists of an orange jumpsuit. 
and you're going to get sheltered. It's going to be warm in jail. So that might not be a bad goal. What would be a bad goal? I don't think goals are usually bad. You don't think goals are usually bad? It's usually a fun Okay. My goal is to prove the existence of God. Is that a good goal? I used to be very interested. I, I, was, I was a classical letters major to start out with, so I took a lot of philosophy courses. One of the reasons I liked philosophy was that I was very concerned about my, as most young people are, my own mortality, and whether or not there was a God, whether or not we could prove that. I have heard all of the proofs for the existence of God. None of them are satisfactory in my mind. So is that a good goal? Can you prove or disprove the existence of God? I don't think you can. So is that a good goal? I don't think it is. If you can't achieve the goal, is it a good goal? Now, I'm sure if you cross the parking lot to the land of hippie dippy over there, the philosophers will tell you that that's a perfectly good goal. But, you know, I, I, I mean, like, that's a worthless goal. You can't prove or disprove the existence of God. So what makes a good goal? It's graduating. Well, okay, you're going to graduate with a degree in underwater basket weaving. No. So how do we make this goal a better goal? I want to graduate with a what? I want to graduate with a degree in marketing. That's a good goal. <laughs> a better goal. I want to graduate with a degree in professional sales. Why? Professional selling is the only major and minor on campus that has a 100% placement of our graduates. 80% of our graduates make $100,000 in their first year. I think you might want to consider this. That would be a good goal. Can we make it a better goal? I think we can. I want to graduate with a degree in professional sales in four years. What makes that a really good goal? Uh, what? Ah, okay. Yeah, it's. Um, It's specific. It's not just I want to graduate with a degree. I mean, how are you going to do that? You're going to flip through the course catalog. The degree programs are all listed in that book. You don't actually get the book anymore. You can go online. You're just going to hit the scroll button on the thing, and whatever degree comes up first, that's what you're going to graduate. No. It's specific. It's objective. What else makes this? I want to graduate with a degree in professional sales in four years. Specific, specific degree, it's objective. Can we measure it? Yep. We can measure it. We can determine whether or not we're successful in this goal. If at the end of four years we don't have a degree in professional sales, we might need to do what? We might need to rethink our goal. Is that necessarily a bad thing? Are you an utter failure? Should you crawl in a hole and die if you don't meet the goal? No. You should be flexible. Life intervenes. If you get pneumonia and you have to drop out a semester, it may take you more time. But you can still work towards that goal. And you can determine whether or not you're making progress on that goal. And finally, to be a good goal, it should be realistic. Now, this does not mean that you should not have stretch goals for yourself. I want to graduate with a degree in professional sales, and I want to do it in four years. Does the average freshman entering college today graduate? We call it a four-year degree. 
Does the average person graduate in four years? No. no, they don't. I graduated in four years when I got my undergraduate degree, and my mother thought I was a complete and utter slacker. Because she started college when she was 17 and she graduated in three years. And so I, you know, started at 17 and graduated in four, and she thought I was slacking. The honest to God truth is, are you all slackers because you're not going to graduate in four years? No. Why was she able to graduate? Well, when she went to college back in the dark ages, her parents paid for it. It was relatively cheap. You could afford it. The state paid for most of it. At that point in time, if you could get into college, she went to the University of New Mexico, the state paid for 90% of what it cost to educate you. And you paid for about 10%. So tuition for an entire semester, up to 18 hours, was something like $75. And there were all of these stupid fees on top of that. You know these fees for things that you'll never use? Like, I, I don't know, there's a speed. There's a building fee. Well, uh, maybe you're using that. You're sitting here in the building today. There's an instructional fee. Well, you're using that because I'm lecturing at you today, I guess. But there's an activity fee. The vast majority of you are not going to ever use that activity fee. What is that fund? This is a commuter school that funds all of those stupid clubs that everybody wants you to join that you don't have time to join because you're doing what? Unlike me, whose parents paid for my, my way to college, and I got scholarships here, graduated, you know, uh, in Oklahoma with scholarships, so I, I didn't have to work. Most of you have to work. How many of you have to have a job? That's the biggest reason people don't graduate for four years anymore, is the vast majority of you no longer have the luxury of spending all of your time focused on. So this is not necessarily a bad goal, and it's not necessarily unrealistic. You may not achieve it. But you can achieve it. You know, I'm going to graduate. I, I, took, I had to take more time off for, for work, and so I, I'm going to take an extra semester. And the average uh, college graduate now graduates in five and a half years, I think. Something like 45 to 50 percent graduate within um, five years. So it should be realistic. What would not be a realistic goal? Well, I want to graduate. It would be specific, objective, and measurable. I want to graduate with a degree in professional sales. I want to start, and I want to graduate in two and a half years. Is that even physically possible? Not even if you took every summer, every intercession, every, you know, you can't do it in two years. So that's not realistic. So it has to be a realistic goal. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be a stretch goal. So four years is a stretch goal for most people, but it's not completely unrealistic. So you should have goals that challenge you, but not so much so that they are completely with, out of the realm of possibility. So the things that make good goals are they're specific and objective, measurable, and realistic. Why is I want to prove or disprove the existence of God not a good goal? It is objective. It's perfectly objective. I'm going to either prove or disprove the existence of God. It's not realistic. Is it measurable? We could say I'm going to prove or disprove the existence of God by the end of my lifetime. That's measurable. If we get to the end, and I haven't proven or disproven it, we can measure that. But is it realistic? I, I don't know. Physicists who are studying particle matter at the super collider believe that maybe one day we'll be able to find a God particle, I guess. But I, I doubt it. I don't think it's really realistic. So, goals are going to be based on an individual or organization. They're going to be dependent upon the individual. I think you ought to get a degree in professional sales because you'll get a good job, you'll make a lot of money, but not everybody wants to do that. Are salesmen born or are they made? Well, I don't know. A lot of people say, you know, they're, they're natural salesmen. My brother's best friend, all through elementary and up through high school was this little kid named Garrett Vance. You might have heard of his father. It's John Vance Motors. They have all these commercials on television uh, where it's real comfortable to buy a truck. And Garrett was the biggest con artist I've ever met in my entire life. I mean, the kid, he was, he was born selling and conning people, and, and he's still doing it, and he's really successful. He works for his dad. He's still, sells, he's still selling you know, stuff. 
And I think he was, he was born a salesman. His dad's a good salesman. Can we make you a salesman? I think we can. Now, if you are just one of these people that just yearns to slurp down coffee, smoke cigarettes, and balance checkbooks, I'm not sure I can help you. If you just love accounting, may God have mercy on your immortal soul. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm not sure, you know. So, you know, if you want to be an accountant, not a salesperson, it's going to be up to the individual. So they are going to be individually or organizationally dependent. In the business world, what types of organizations do we have? Well, we have three basic types. We have for-profits, and the goal of a for-profit, broadly speaking, is to what? To make money. To make money for its owners however they are defined. Shareholders, DBAs. What's the most basic form of business entity that you can have that's a for-profit? What's the smallest or most basic kind of, of business that you can have? A sole proprietorship, which we also call a DBA, a doing business as. There's also a degree called a DBA, Doctor of Business Administration. But in the organizational realm, the DBA is the most basic form. You have an idea, you can go out, and you can start a business. Years and years and years ago, before I became a marketing professor, when I was teaching um, law here at UCO, I had a student come and tell me he got his first job offer as a marketing communications director with the company. He was about to graduate, and I said, that's great, Justin. And he said, yeah, they offered me $36,000. This was 15 years ago. That was pretty good money for a first job out of school. I said, that's fantastic. He said, yeah, the only problem is that when I was in high school, I started a lawn mowing company, and I made $250,000 last year. And I said, well, if your degree taught you anything here at UCO, it's that you need to keep mowing yards. He had built this little business. He'd started, he grew up here in Edmond. He started by... His dad bought him a lawnmower, a pickup, a uh, trailer, and a weed eater. And he went around. And by the time he graduated from college, he had several crews that worked for him, mowing yards here in Edmond. And it was a DBA. Don't have to tell anybody. You can just start mowing yards. Get yourself a lawnmower, a weed eater, you know, and, and run around and mow yards. Then we increase in complexity. What's the next most simple type of organization, a partnership. This is like a DBA, but it's got what? More than two. More than, yeah, more than one. Two or more people. And then you can get more complex organizations where you form something called a corporation and you can have lots of people, right? You can have lots of partners, too. The idea behind all of these forms, DBA, Partnership Corporation, is that you're going to want to make money for the owners, the shareholders of the company. They're also not-for-profits. And they use marketing as well and goals and objectives. Now, what are non-profits? Well, they're entities or organizations that don't exist for a profit motivation. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't make money or that they don't sell things. They do in many instances. But the goal is not to remit a profit back to their shareholders. It's to do something else. So what are some of the non-profits out there? Charities. What? Charities. Is a specific one. Goodwill. Goodwill. Yeah. UNICEF. Red Cross is a big one. And Red Cross advertises and they raise money. And what's their goal? Well, it's to aid in disasters. Relief. And then we have governments. Do governments use marketing? Sure. They use marketing in terms of logistics. But they also use advertising, promotion, things like that. What is it that the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marines want you to do? They want you to join. And so they use marketing and promotion and things like that. And so all of these types use marketing. And the type and goal it's going to be dependent. What is the goal of a governmental organization? Well, it's to fulfill the mission of that entity. So what's the goal of a police department? 
To what? To protect and serve, that's what they say. To harass the populace, I don't know. <laughs> that, you know that's, that seems to be what they do. But um, you know, their, their goal is to protect and serve, to reduce crime. And they use marketing to do that, right? They're going to have to buy things. They're going to have to procure things. And they want to do what? They want to reduce crime. So they have all kinds of programs and advertisements that they do. Outreach, things like what? Dare Neighborhood Watch. watch. Program. What? Dare. The DARE. The DARE program. That's one that they uh, go out to high schools and try to keep kids off drugs and things like that. Um, so the types for profit that we have DBA partnership and corporation. Now, there are others within these types that are subcategories of these types of for-profits. So for example, under partnerships, you can have general or limited partnerships. Those are more specific. Under corporations, you can have what? You can have things <coughs> like sub-S corporations, which is actually an entity under the tax code. You can have LLC, limited liability companies, which operate like a DBA, but have the advantages of the corporate form, and so there are some subtypes. But those are the three basic types of for-profits. And most of what we'll study in this class will be for-profit organizations. But you should recognize that these non-for-profits, individuals, and governmental units also use marketing, and they uh, rely on it. And those um, things and the principles that we'll talk about are equally as applicable in many instances to those types of organizations as they are to for-profits. So strategy. Long, it's usually long term, although as you get further down in an organization and it becomes more specific as opposed to more general, the length and term of the goals becomes more and more temporally uh, short term. So from broad to narrow, starting at the top, at the corporate level, so lots of corporations are comprised of various things, that they're not just one type of entity. Broadly speaking, what does 3M do? How many of you have heard of 3M? Okay, a few of you have heard of 3M. What does 3M do? They make a lot of products. They're mostly known for what? What? Adhesives. Adhesives, that's right. Yeah, they're mostly known for adhesives. But there are all kinds of adhesives out there. What's one of 3M's most widely known adhesive products? Double-sided tape. Double-sided tape. OK, what was it? Scotch tape. Scotch tape. What else? Post-its. 3M allows their people to spend a certain amount of their time and their research and development team on projects that interest them, that are not necessarily corporate sponsored. One of these projects was a guy who was coming up with an adhesive, and it turns out he came up with an adhesive that wasn't particularly adhesive. But it was adhesive enough that if you stuck two pieces of paper together, they would stick, but you could do what? You could peel it off. Whereas if you stuck it together with tape, what happens? Yeah, you, when you, if you tape something, if you tape two pieces of paper together, if you use the double-sided tape that someone just gave us the example of, let's say you use two-sided tape, stick two pieces of paper together, what's going to happen when you try and separate those? Well, it's more adhesive, and it's probably going to tear. So post-its, they came up with this idea, this guy came up with this adhesive that wasn't terribly adhesive, but it was adhesive enough that you could stick stuff, but you could remove it. Now, those are really wonderful for doing things like what? What do you all use post-its for? They've come up with all kinds of uses for post-its. Reminders. Reminders. What else do college students use a lot of post-its for? Notes. And sticking stuff in your book. How many of you have tabbed your book with post-its? And they've now come up with little specific tabs that you can use that are use the post-it adhesive so that you can mark you know, various chapters or various things that you want to to use. What else? So that's one adhesive that 3M comes up with. What else is another adhesive that they come up with? Well, how many of you had braces when you were in junior high or high school? I had braces. How many? That was a miserable experience, wasn't it? Horrible experience. When I got my braces years ago, it took a long time for them to actually put the braces on. So what the dentist would do 
is they would take the stuff, they would prep the tooth, and then they would take the adhesive and they would stick the bracket on there, and they had to hold each bracket on there for about five minutes until the bracket solidified. 3M came up with a much better way of doing this. It was called Light Cure. How many of you have Light Cure brackets? It, 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 it's almost, it adheres almost instantly. So what they do is they put, it, they put the goo on the bracket, they stick it on, and they hit it with an ultraviolet light, and it cures like that. When I got my braces, it took, to do an entire set of braces, took like two hours of me sitting in the orthodontist chair, and him, they had to dry out the tooth, you know, with these little bands and a little air gun, and then stick it on there, and it took a long time. They come up with Light Cure, and that's a radically improved way of putting on braces, and guess what? It's an adhesive, but is it like an adhesive like Post-its? No, so these are two different business units that are going to be selling these things. Who buys Post-its? Largely office products and office supplies, staples and things like that. So they have different divisions within 3M. They have an entire division that works on dental stuff or medical adhesives. Not braces, but what kinds of things? Bandages and stuff like that. So you have these different things. So at the corporate level, you have 3M, which is this umbrella corporation that has subunits. So you have this big umbrella, which is 3M, and then you have business products, that's like post-its, tape, double-sided tape, scotch tape. You have dental, medical, you know, all these different things. So each of these, so at the corporate level, what are they going to be focused on? The CEO of 3M, what kinds of goals and strategy is he going to be focused on? Is he going to be focused on whether or not this scientist comes up with a new adhesive in the next 90 days? No. What's he going to be focused on? The whole company. The whole company, long-term strategy, usually what? In terms of strategic planning, is he going to be focused on the next quarter? Or is he going to be focused on the next five years? If he's smart, he's going to be focused on the next one. Five years. Broadly speaking, where is the company going to go in the next five years? What's going to be the big challenges for the company? Should they diversify and get out? Should they get beyond adhesives and move into other products? Beyond that, 3M actually has gone beyond adhesives, by the way. That's not without risk. So he's going to be focused on five years, ten years, long-term goals. At the business products level, so under business products, you'll have uh, maybe a VP or maybe even a president of that division, that strategic business unit. What are they going to be focused on? What? Yeah, they're going to be focused on business products. What is the trend in business products? Is the president of that unit still going to be focused on five years out? Maybe, but more likely he's going to be focused on what? As opposed to the next five years, maybe the next what? Year, right? What are we going to do in the next year to, to develop new business products? What is the face of business products? How is it changing? What kinds of things are, are, are happening? How have business products changed in the last 10 years, for example? We've gone online. We're going to focus on things like that. And then below these strategic business units, you usually have departments, right? So you might have tape, you might have paper products, and things like that. At that department level, what are they going to be focused on? What? Yeah, much more specific, the product and what? A much shorter time frame the next quarter, the next month, the next week. So what your goals are um, depends on where you're at in this. Um, for most of you, and we talk about this because it's listed in the text, but the vast majority of you will go to work for what kind of business, statistically? Are you going to go to work for, there was a time in this country, and we talk about this, but one of the things that you ought to recognize is that most of you are going to go to work for a small to mid-sized business. Why? There are just a lot more of them out there. The vast majority of businesses in this country are small to mid-sized businesses. 
And so most of you will actually go to work. And so what you're going to be focused on in those companies is going to be far more um, narrowly ta tailored and more short term. Lots of small to mid range businesses are just focused on what? A lot of them are focused on survival. So what do we need to do for long-term success? Um, Jim Collins and Jerry Price wrote a book that's become very, very influential in business circles called Built to Last. Successful Habits of Visionary Companies. And they studied 18 companies. Most of these had been established for over 100 years. The vast majority of them outperformed the market. And what did they find? They outperformed the market. So what are the things that outperform the market? What's an example of a company that outperforms the market? Berkshire Hathaway. What is Berkshire Hathaway? Nobody, as business students, you should know what Berkshire Hathaway is. It's real estate. They're more than real estate. Who's the CEO of Berkshire Hathaway? Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett. Who said that? You get five points. If you will, that's fine. Finding information is important. <laughs> Share of Class A share of Berkshire stock, $317,800. Berkshire has seriously outperformed the market. For five points, what is Warren Buffett's nickname? What do they call him? You can Google it. The Oracle, you get 10 points, wow. The Oracle of Omaha. <laughs> so Berkshire is one of these companies that outperforms. I don't remember if it was actually the study we built last. But what they found is that they have a core set of values. Now this is important. Let's think about this as an individual. What, how can we apply this to your individual life? As an individual, you should have a core set of values. What was interesting though, is that these values don't necessarily have to be what we would think of as being good values. One of the companies they looked at was Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson's core values summarized in their creed. We believe our first responsibility is to the doctors, nurses, and patients, to mothers and fathers, and all others who use our products and services. In meeting their needs, everything we do must be of high quality. We must consistently strive to reduce our costs in order to maintain reasonable prices. Customers' orders must be serviced promptly and accurately. Our suppliers and distributors must have an opportunity to make a fair profit. We are responsible to our employees, the men and women who work with us throughout the world, Everyone must be considered as an individual. We must respect their dignity and recognize their merit. They must have a sense of security in their jobs. Compensation must be fair and adequate, and working conditions clean, orderly, and safe. We must be mindful of the ways to help our employees fulfill their family responsibilities. Employees must feel free to make suggestions and complaints. There has to be equal opportunity for employment, development, and advancement for those qualified. We have to provide competent management and their actions must be just and ethical. We are responsible for the communities in which we live and work, and the world community as well. We must be good citizens, support good works and charities, bear our fair share of taxes, encourage civic improvement and better health and education. We must maintain in good order the property we are privileged to use, protecting the environment and natural resources. Our final responsibility is to our stockholders. Businesses must make a sound profit, we must experiment with new ideas. Research must be carried on. Innovative programs developed and the state to pay for. 
New equipment must be purchased, new facilities provided, and new products launched. Reserves must be created to provide for adverse times. When we operate according to these principles, the stockholders should realize a fair return. I read this entire thing to you because I think this is good values, or what we would say are good values. Why is that? These are aspirational goals. They are visionary and lofty in their sentiment. We want to treat people fairly. Now, one of the things that you have to think about in this class is that although we talk about these topics as though they are distinct concepts, they are not necessarily mutually exclusive concepts. They are fully into, this is why marketing is the only fully integrated function of the firm. All of this stuff has to combine together. And so we'll talk uh, in, in, in a very short order about ethics and what that means to be an ethical company. And I think Johnson & Johnson, by and large, on the whole, for the most part, has been an ethical company throughout most of their history. But they're not the only successful company. Philip Morris, what does Philip Morris manufacture? Whoever can tell me what they're famous for gets five points. Who said that? Cigarettes, that's right. They are... One of the major producers of cigarettes. In contrast to Johnson & Johnson, who says we have to work to improve the world, Philip Morris's core values were described as ruthless, cunning, and Machiavellian. For five points, what does Machiavellian mean? Who's it named after? Go ahead. It's named after Machiavelli and the Prince. You both get five points. It's amazing what you can get. I have a pet squirrel. We've trained her to do tricks. She knows 35 distinct words. So I'm training you to answer my questions. Like the seal at the zoo. Um, Philip Morris manufactures cigarettes. The CEO of Philip Morris was described as ruthlessly focused and absolutely indignant about the fact that there was nothing wrong with smoking. He was quoted as saying, I see absolutely nothing morally objectionable to providing people with a good that they do not need. It goes beyond simply that they don't need it. It actually does what? It's harmful. It's not just, I mean, to, to say a cigarette is something that you don't need is in and of itself a morally bankrupt idea. It's not just that cigarettes are not needed. There are lots of things that are not needed but are not necessarily inherently harmful. You don't need the T-bone steak, but is it inherently harmful? I don't know. Research tends to suggest that maybe it is. People who eat a lot of red meat have higher levels of what? Cholesterol, higher levels of heart disease, cancer, things like that. But I, I, is the, is the T-bone, like if you have a T-bone, can anybody just smoke one cigarette? Anybody in here a smoker? I was a smoker for a long time. I quit 15 years ago. It, nobody smokes one cigarette. It's enormously harmful. How many of you have seen a movie called Thank You for Smoking? This is an accurate depiction of what they actually did. They actually had scientists at Philip Morris and other large cigarette manufacturers, and along with the gun lobby, that was the other one that they highlighted in Thank You for Smoking, that attempted to prove that there was no correlation between smoking and heart disease and smoking and cancer and things like that. They actually went out of their way and they lobbied heavily on this. And so you don't necessarily have to have good values, you just have to have values. It's important to ask, when you think about this, what is it we do? In your text, they talk about Theodore Levitt's marketing myopia. 
if we went back in time, the largest businesses at the beginning of the 20th century, some of the largest companies in the United States, were railroad companies. And if you think about this, this makes a lot of sense. It's the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. You're moving products from producers to consumers very efficiently. How you do that is going to be worth a lot of money, and it's railroad. Now, are the biggest companies in America today still railroad companies? No, in fact, most of them are gone. Most of those early companies are, are no longer in existence, and why is that? Well, they had marketing myopia. They thought of themselves as really good railroad companies, and they ran really good railroad companies. But the thing about it is, is that are we shipping a lot of stuff by railroad today? Well, we still ship a good amount, but we also ship more stuff by what? Semi. By semi, by truck. How else? We, we are coming up on the largest rose buying day in America. That's February 14th, and it's called Valentine's Day. And you are supposed to buy your fiancé. That's Oklahoman for fiancé. I have a whole Oklahoma to English dictionary. <laughs> I was born and raised in, in Oklahoma. I dearly love the great and sovereign state of Oklahoma. It's a perversion I share only with consenting adults, but I do admit that our language skills in this part of the country leave something to be desired. So fiancé is how we say fiancé in Oklahoma. I have, I'm a lawyer. I had a judge tell me one time, for example, in my list of Oklahoma to English words, he said, Mr. Gary, it seems to me, actually called me choir, the epitome of your case, E-T-I-T-O-M-E, -E. and I said, huh? <laughs> and he said, epitome, E-P-I-T-O-M-E, -E. are you itching? No, your honor. How do you pronounce that word? Epitome, right? Yeah. The epitome. Your fiancé. So, you're supposed to buy your fiancé, your insignificant other, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is you have, what, on Valentine's Day? Chocolate and? And flowers. And preferably, marketers have convinced us that you need to buy them at least a dozen red roses. As red as the color of love. If you buy them yellow roses, what do you say? Yeah. I just want to be friends. <laughs> Let's just be friends. Roses grow in abundance on February 14th in Oklahoma? Nope. Where do they grow? In abundance in February. South America. The vast majority of roses that we sold on Valentine's Day come from South America. You think they're getting here by train? Those roses are going to be dead by the time that train gets here. How do they get here to Oklahoma? What? They fly them in by airplane. It's one of the reasons why a dozen roses is so expensive, right? Because they're having to fly them in from South America. So these companies thought of themselves as railroad companies when what they should have thought of themselves as is what? Transportation companies. They had marketing myopia. They were focused on making the trains run, and what they missed was the fact that the world was changing, and it's not, we're not working on railroads. Their railroads are still important. They still transport a lot of stuff. But we transport in a variety of different ways. And so if they had focused on the broader thing, which is transportation, some of them may have still been in existence today. So what is it we do thinking broadly about that? So growth strategies. The Boston Consulting Group has a portfolio for your analysis of your products. So let's think about this. Where you want to be is high, high, generally. These are called stars. If you have high market growth or high market potential and you have a dominant share of the market, 
that is a star. So it's a two by two matrix that goes high, high, low, low, based on market growth and relative market share of the company. Let's think about this in terms of cell phones. What's an example of a star? You think the iPhone is a star? Probably. Although, is it? Is there much more market growth in cell phones in the United States at this point? Are you going to grow it? If you want to grow, you're probably going to have to look at worldwide. Rather than the market being the United States, you're going to have to look. Obviously, the vast majority of people in the United States, how many people actually have a landline anymore? Any of you have a landline? Why do you have a landline? <laughs> <laughs> you got four, you get four cell phones. Yeah, you, that's Why that's not? Great. You, you force your... My God, someone should call DHS. <laughs> it's practically child abuse. Don't you understand the benefits of this? That if you give them this device, you know where they are at all times. It's like a little tracking mechanism. <laughs> I don't know, in the United States, the iPhone may be a cash cow. I don't know, it's debatable. Is there a lot of growth potential? There's a lot of growth potential worldwide. I don't know that there's a lot of growth potential in the United States at this point. The vast majority of people, although there may still be, you may argue that there are. There are lots of people, particularly what we'll talk about when we talk about um, buying types, types of consumers, we'll look at uh, various types of people from survivors, which are sort of at the bottom, to innovators, which are at the top. And there are a lot of survivors in this country, people who don't have smartphones. The elderly, for example, you might try and tap into that market and convince them that they need it. And the iPhone has been radically successful in doing that, by the way, because of its what? Its, it's simplicity, right? It's, it's a very user-friendly and almost intuitive platform. And so it's been pretty successful in that. So the iPhone might be a star. What would be an example of a question mark? There's high growth, so let's assume, we'll assume that there's still high growth potential in cell phones. What would be a question mark cell phone? The Google Pixel. I think that's right. Who said that? You get five points. The Google Pixel. Because Google is a huge company. They have a lot of potential, but what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to convince people in a market that's already fairly well saturated, that they need to switch from the what? The iPhone to the Google Pixel. You're going to have to make it a lot better. So that might be a question mark. What's an example of a dog? Black Motorola black flip phone. Yeah. Flip phone. You know, right? Yeah. I mean, um, is anybody happy? You have a Motorola flip phone. You hold it up. I think it's not a Motorola, but yeah. Okay, it's a flip phone. Why do you have that? So all you do is text and call. All you do is text and call. Yeah, Isn't it really hard to text? Not really. <laughs> okay. All right. Like it's amazing what people still have. I, that, I, you know, what's a cash cow in this market? Well, uh, the iPhone 7 might actually be a cash cow. They're still selling a lot of them, but what are they doing? Is Apple focusing all their marketing activities on that? No. It's not the most ancient technology. They make a lot of money. Why is, uh, why is the iPhone 7 maybe a cash cow? People can afford it more easily than they can afford the 8 or even the 10. But what are you going to do with the cash cow? Well, you generally try to harvest the profits to put into developing things that are going to be stars. So looking at this and figuring out where your products are is going to be important. In terms of developing growing strategies. It is estimated by some marketing scholars that companies need to be consistently working on 25 or more new ideas at any one given time. Why is that? Particularly if we think about cell phones are a good one to think about because the tastes and preferences are changing very, very quickly. If you went back in time 20 years ago to when the first smartphones were coming out, 
What were people primarily, those who bought smartphones, using them for? Well, they were primarily business people because they were the only ones that could afford to have them. And they were using them for communication and sales and marketing and things like that. What are we using this for now? Every, yeah, it's mostly a what? It's mostly a social media device. In fact, it's less of a phone anymore and more of something else. Why is that? Because your generation doesn't actually want to call anybody. You don't want to talk on the phone. My generation, I'm a Gen Xer, we wanted to talk on the phone because it was less personal than in face, face to face, and that's how we grew up. But your generation grew up not communicating face to face by doing what? Texting, posting, tweeting, Snapchatting. It's a much more impersonal thing. So what are you going to come up with in the next to, to, to be your next um, big uh, what's going to be the next big thing that's going to come out? I don't know. How much more can we change this device to, to you know, take advantage of the next wave? What is going to be the next way that they're going to probably going to invest in? We got pretty small. I know it's going to be small. Yeah. I don't know. It's going to be an easier way of even using it. Maybe it's going to be the implant in your brain so that you only have to think about it to get it. That's kind of creepy. It's rather Orwellian, isn't it, to think about that? Although every semester when I ask this question about would you do that, would you put an implant in your kid's brain so that you can communicate with them, I have some student that would tell me. I used to ask the question years ago before I could even think about this. I used to say when the chipping first came out, they would chip dogs. Would you chip your kid? It's amazing to me how many people said they'd chip their kid. Would you chip your kid? I think it's a little full 1984. If you're interested in that, there's a new dystopian that's come out with, uh, or a fairly recent dystopian that's come out with Tom Hanks. I think it's called The Circle. I just watched it the other night. You did see that one. Um, so, in doing this, we're going to conduct uh, what we call a SWOT analysis. Two of these are internal and two are external. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So strengths and weaknesses are the internal things that you have control over. The external are things like opportunities and threats. So what gives you a competitive advantage in the market? What are your strengths as a company? As an individual, as you go out and you market yourself, you should think about this, and it's one of the reasons that I had you think about these on the first day of class with regard to your strengths. But you also need to think about your weaknesses. All of us have weaknesses. What are my strengths? Well, I'm a pretty good communicator. I write pretty well as an academic. I can publish a lot. But what are my weaknesses? And how can I improve on those? Well, I'll tell you. I mean, I'm a procrastinator. I put things off until the last minute. I firmly believe that I do my best work under pressure. Most of you probably believe this as well. And actually, studies do show that procrastination, although it's generally considered a weakness, may be a strength, because people do actually perform slightly better when there's a more incentive. But think, you know, think about these. What are, what are the strengths? Let's think about it in terms of a company. What's Apple's strength? They have a huge market share. They were innovative when Steve Jobs was there. What's the big weakness now with Apple? Do you think? Yeah. They're not really doing anything new. They are they're not when Jobs was there, they were engaging in radical innovation. Disruptive, what we call disruptive innovation in the marketplace. They're no longer doing that. They're largely doing incremental. Is the iPhone 10, one of my friends, this is a 7, one of my friends went and just got the 10 when it was, the first day it was released. He's one of these that we would call an innovator. 
he has to have the latest and greatest. And can you tell that much difference between the 10 and this one in terms of the functionality? It's got, a, you cannot charge it using a cord. It has, I, I think, that's right with the 10. Am I correct? Anybody have a 10? It uses the wireless charge. Okay, it does. So is that a radical trend? Radical no. no. Not really. They've done that with toothbrushes forever, haven't they? <laughs> Electric toothbrushes have had wireless charging for a long time now. Um, so it's, you know, is it really that radical of change? I think Apple is largely because of their size, they've become an incrementalist. Whereas smaller companies generally are able to innovate more quickly because they're more what? They're more flexible. They're easier to change. They're more adaptable. And so I think that can become a weakness. The external opportunities. What are the opportunities in the market? Right now, there are lots of opportunities because the market is generally pretty what? What's going on in the American economy today? Well, we have what's called anything below 5% unemployment is considered what? Full employment. Because at 5% or less, what you really have is you just have people that are transitioning between jobs. They're not really unemployed. Now, we can debate whether or not that figure is accurate, but for, by and large, for the most part, the American economy is pretty good. But that can change rapidly, can't it? We could go into a recession and have rapid unemployment, and that could become a threat. When, when we have big changes in the economy, people stop buying. They'll hold on to this device a lot longer. What is it that Apple relies upon as part of their marketing strategy? Well, it's called planned obsolescence. It's the cannibalization of their own products. Apple releases a new iPhone every, what, two years historically, so that you'll do what? You'll want to buy the biggest and best and newest and latest and greatest innovation in technology. When the economy goes bad, even if you have a job, what do you might do? The iPhone 10 costs how much money? It's $1,000. If you're not sure about your job, you might what? Hang on to the 7 a lot longer. And that could become a threat. I'm out of time, so we'll stop there. Um, I did pass a roll sheet. If you came in late, be sure to sign it. And we'll pick up with this and move on to ethics next time.